Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear the opening sections of Nancy Wilson's Learning Contentment, read by Jana Lindstrom. Introduction Imagine how comfortable our lives would be if we learned to keep our spirits in order in all circumstances. Unruffled, undisturbed, calm, not reacting, not chafing, cheerful, not churned up with the daily dramas. What a huge spiritual, emotional, and physical benefit that would be. But we live in a world where it is easy and acceptable to be stressed out by circumstances and events. And we even plan for, excuse, and accommodate stressed outness. After all, it is the mother of the bride, or the new wife, or the new mother. And how could we expect anything else during finals week, or the first week on the new job, or when the bills are overdue, or when the baby is overdue? Funny when you think about it, we had to coin the term stressed out to describe this common condition of a disordered heart. We even use being stressed out as an excuse for anger, unkindness, rudeness, worry, or flaking out on our duties. It can even cause us to get sick. But stressed out is not a neutral behavior. It is a sinful manifestation of an unquiet heart, and it often brings a host of other sins with it. Contentment maintains control over the spirit and does not allow ungoverned passions and unrestrained emotions to bring discomposure right at the moment when the greatest composure is called for. Contentment calms the heart and leads the heart to act and speak wisely, even when under great provocation. In fact, especially when under great provocation. Just because a situation is stressful doesn't mean we have to become stressed out. Our daily lives are fraught with many provocations. Are we going to let them have power over us? We get sick. We're stuck in traffic. We miss our flight. Someone lets us down. Someone is unkind or rude. We forgot an appointment. Someone was late. Do we allow these things to arouse our hearts to anger? Impatience? Annoyance? Or general irritation? If we do, then we need to enroll in a class to learn contentment. We often think contentment is something that happens to us, rather than something that we take pains to learn. We assume that if we are not naturally disposed to be that way, then it's fine to have a fiery temper or a sharp tongue. We make excuses for our behavior. After all, we tell ourselves, our parents had anger issues, so we accept the fact that we will have them too. And it's easier to just go with our natural impulses and get stressed out by all the drama in our lives. But this is false. Each of us can learn contentment, and each of us should learn contentment. It is an important part of our Christian life. It is not optional. This requires work. We're going to have to give ourselves to our lessons and study contentment. We have to pay attention. Otherwise, there's not much hope of gaining contentment. We can learn it, but not without spiritual and mental attentiveness. Even the Apostle Paul said he learned contentment, so there's no reason to suppose that we can get it without any learning. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 11-13, New King James Version. Paul doesn't say he was born a naturally contented person. Rather, God gave him many opportunities to learn it. We should be encouraged by this, because if Paul such a great man of faith had to learn contentment, then there is no shame in confessing that we are going to need some lessons as well. Difficult lessons. We have the same gracious instructor as the Apostle Paul had. Our good and merciful God has given us His Word, His promises, and His Spirit to teach us. 
These are tremendous resources that make contentment attainable. But we must enroll in the class first. And then we must be eager students, diligently studying and learning our lessons. In his wonderful book on contentment, Jeremiah Burroughs compares our spiritual progress in learning contentment to being enrolled in school. He points out that we should be making progress in this school of contentment and not stuck in spiritual kindergarten, learning our alphabet for the umpteenth time. Learning is more than simply reciting a Bible verse. It is applying it, doing it, and making it ours. So we have to be able to do contentment, not just recite Philippians 4, 11, and 12. Just like good students, we will have to go over material and prepare for the tests that we know will be coming. And I have to warn you that most of these tests are pop quizzes. But when God gives us a test, it is always open book. Think of that. He never leaves us but walks through each test with us, giving us the power to pass. Of course, if we pass a test, then we will move on to harder material. If we fail, we can rest assured that we will have a redo very soon. So, in our pursuit of contentment, there is no point in shrinking back for fear of a test. Each pop quiz is an opportunity to practice what we've learned. Then, when we have mastered the material, we can move on to the next level of growth in Christ. To get started on this business of learning contentment, we need a working definition. I've seen a few excellent definitions, but I find my mother-in-law Bessie's comes most readily to mind and covers all the territory in a few words. Contentment is a deep satisfaction with the will of God. Let's go back to the passage in Philippians for a moment. Paul says he is satisfied when he is hungry, satisfied when he is full, satisfied when he has to go without, and satisfied when he has all he needs. He says he is satisfied in all places and in all things. He makes it clear that there is nothing that he finds to be unsatisfactory. Why? Because he understands that God has put him in each circumstance on purpose. He knows that in each circumstance, no matter how difficult, God is doing this for him and not to him. This understanding helps us read what is happening to us as designed by our good Father who is growing us up in Christ. Difficulties are not for nothing. They grow us. And this growth is faster when we are stewarding the difficulties with contentment. Contentment is not listed in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, and 23. But it would find good company there. Contentment is loving, joyful, peaceful, suffers long, is kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled. This fruit is not something we generate ourselves, but it originates with the Holy Spirit. In the same way, He is the source of all our contentment. The normal state of man is certainly not contentment. We creatures can find much to complain about in all circumstances. Even the best circumstances can be less than perfect. It's too hot or too cold, too short or too tall, too much or too little, too early or too late, too wet or too dry. Is Paul just too easily satisfied? No. He has learned to have control over his own spirit in every situation of life. He knows that God is in control of all things, exercising his sovereign will in and over every aspect of his life. Therefore, Paul is satisfied with all that God is doing. But how does he exercise control over his spirit so it agrees with and is satisfied with God's will? Why isn't Paul stressed out? That is what I hope to address in this book, how we, like Paul, can have contented hearts in all circumstances. Before we move on, let's do a quick survey of some of Paul's hardships to see if he really knows what he is talking about. In what sort of circumstances did he learn contentment? From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day. I've been in the deep, 
in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things. What comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. 2 Corinthians 11, 24-28 This is the same man who says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Philippians 4.11 This is remarkable. How does he do it? Here's his answer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Verse 13 Without Christ there is no contentment, but through and with Christ we can do this difficult thing. Enrolling in a class on contentment is not like enrolling in a Spanish class. Learning contentment requires supernatural strength. Contentment is only possible because Christ strengthens his people to be content. There is no other way. Contentment is not hardening yourself so you do not care what happens. It is not being a stoic, nor is it bottling things up. Contentment is the result of spiritual strength that comes directly from Christ. Contentment is the ability to stay satisfied with God's will in all circumstances, whether easy or difficult. Though it is simple to understand, it is certainly not easy to do. That is why we need lessons to learn this skill. And we need an expert teacher, which we certainly have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 1. The Father's Contentment As we open up this topic of contentment, we should look first at the example that God himself sets for us of contentment, both in his own character and in the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. In later chapters, we will consider how we can imitate him in this. When God created the world, he pronounced each day's work as good. After the creation of light on the first day, Genesis 1-4 records, And God saw the light, that it was good. At the end of each subsequent day's work, the text says, And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1 10, 13, 18, 21, 25. Finally, in verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. God was satisfied with his work and content with his labor, so he rested. From this we can deduce that contentment leads to rest. We will come back to this aspect of contentment shortly. We all remember the great exception to this when God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Genesis 2.18 So he remedied this problem by creating woman. But woman was not content, and she succumbed to the temptation of the serpent. If she had been content with all God had given her, she would not have taken the forbidden fruit and eaten it. Discontent is fertile ground for planting unlawful desires. Consider all that Eve had. She lived in paradise. She had the perfect husband. She had unbroken fellowship with her creator. If anyone had perfect circumstances, it was Eve. And yet the temptation to be discontent was too great, and she distanced herself from God and from her husband choosing up sides with the tempter and following his advice to disobey God. But marvel of marvels, God overturned that when he put enmity between the woman and the serpent. Even though Eve chose to follow the serpent in her disobedience, God pulled her back to his side, separating her from her foolish choice. And of course, God finally overturns this for good in the gospel of grace. As my husband is fond of saying, God draws straight with crooked lines. The creation account exhibits another aspect of God's contentment. God is perfect and all his works are perfect. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Deuteronomy 32.4 
Being perfect, he could have wanted more perfection. One more animal, one more mountain range, one more ocean or one more color. But he was satisfied with his creation. He did not need anything more. He rested. We sometimes flatter ourselves into thinking that it is a good character trait to be a perfectionist. But this label brings much trouble and temptation with it. A so-called perfectionist is never satisfied with his work or anyone else's work. It could always be better, so that means that it is never enough, always falls short. Or because the work is never up to the standards of the perfectionist, he may give up entirely and use his so-called standard of perfection as an excuse for laziness and failure. I am such a perfectionist that it will take too long to get it done to my high standards, so I don't have time to try. This is self-deception. On the occasion when the perfectionist thinks he has achieved or accomplished something perfectly, he may be temporarily satisfied. But this is self-satisfaction and pride. All these reactions are ungodly forms of discontent. As creatures, we must learn to find our true satisfaction in our Creator God. Then we can be satisfied with our imperfect work. Then we can offer our imperfect work to Him and be thankful that He is satisfied with us in Christ. Then we can rest. Only God is perfect. When we think we can be perfect, we are stumbling blindly. God was also well content with Jesus, His beloved Son. The Gospels record two instances of God speaking aloud about His Son. The first was at Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 Three Gospels record a voice coming out of a cloud at the Transfiguration. Matthew 17.5, Mark 9.7, Luke 9.35 And they all record the voice saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Matthew includes, in whom I am well pleased. This reveals God's identification and satisfaction with Jesus, as well as his pleasure in his Son. He is well pleased with him. The Son is beloved of the Father, and the Father speaks aloud of his satisfaction and pleasure in his Son. What a wonderful glimpse given us of the Father's contentment with his Son. Jesus himself offers us another perfect example of contentment. When he was facing his imminent arrest and crucifixion, he struggled in the garden in Gethsemane. He was sorrowful and deeply distressed, Matthew 26, 37. From this we learn that sorrow and distress are not contradictory to contentment. Jesus wrestled in prayer and asked God if there was any possible way. But he concluded this time in prayer with your will be done, Matthew 26, 42. From this point on in the story, Jesus was in complete control of himself and in control of the entire situation. When he was arrested, he did not resist. When he was slandered, he didn't answer. When he was mocked, he stayed in control of himself. He went to the cross content and determined, satisfied with God's will. Paul uses this example of Christ's suffering to admonish us in Philippians 2, 3-8. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus found contentment by means of humility and obedience. He submitted to God and went freely to the cross for us. His resulting glorification and exaltation are our salvation. So at the heart of the gospel is a contented father and son. The father was content to send his son to die for us, sacrificing his only beloved son in whom he was so well pleased. The son was content to be that sacrifice for us, 
and we are called to imitate his frame of mind in this. We are to be obedient and humble, both necessary companions of contentment and satisfaction. Selfish ambition pushes forward, running on discontent and a need to be in front. Conceit thinks only of itself and runs on pride and vanity. But if we want to imitate the mind of Christ, we must be more concerned with others than with ourselves. We can't hold ourselves and our desires in the front of our minds, thinking that we are more important or better than everyone else. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10.45 If we want to find contentment, humility must be our frame of mind. If we want to be like Christ, we must take the form of a servant. We know the Father loves his Son, and we know the Son loves the Father. Therefore, my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. John 10, 17-18 Jesus obeyed God freely. He was content to give his life. He did not have it taken from him. In the same way, we must freely choose to follow and obey God. This is our liberty and our life. When we refuse to obey God, when we are driven by our own desires, it is no surprise that rest and contentment elude us. When we follow Christ in obedience and humility, we find rest for our souls. The Father was content with his work, and he rested. Jesus was content with his work knowing what it would cost him, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12.2 Jesus kept his eyes on his God-given duty. Though he hated the shame, he found contentment in the absolute worst circumstance in all of human history. He did not wait until he felt like obeying. In the same way, In all situations, our contentment looks for its duties. It is quick to ask, how can I obey God in this circumstance? How can I steward this situation in a way that honors and obeys God? Contentment is love for God, and it requires humility and grace. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. This is very straightforward. Do you love Jesus? Then do what he says. And how do we know what he says? By reading his word, by humbling ourselves, by not relying on our own wisdom. We have a Savior who provides us with rest for our souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Contentment brings rest. Discontent brings restlessness. Now that we've looked at the contentment of the Father and the Son, let's consider the ground of our own contentment in the next chapter. Questions. Number one. Why do some people call themselves perfectionists? Is it intended as a flattering statement? Number two. Can you think of ways that a perfectionist can be annoying to others? Number three. What keeps us from lowliness of mind? Number four. What is the world's view of lowliness of mind? Number five. Think about what discontents you have allowed to take root in your life. Do they involve duties you have shirked? If so, How can you address them? Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was the opening section of Nancy Wilson's Learning Contentment. If you'd like to hear the rest of the book on audio, you can purchase it at canonpress.com or anywhere audiobooks are sold.